These animations show three different geosynchronous orbits, where two of them are circular with zero inclination, making them a special case of geosynchronous orbit called geostationary orbit, where they are stationary with respect to the surface of the Earth. So on the right are these orbits as seen in the Earth-centered inertial frame, and on the left is how they are seen in the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame, which can also be thought as how the satellites look to an observer standing on the surface of the rotating Earth. Now pay attention to the spacecraft's attitudes in each of the animations. So the two geostationary satellites have attitudes that are aligned with their local vertical, local horizontal, or LVLH, reference frames. This is where their x-axis is pointed directly at Earth, which is in the red. The z-axis is pointed directly at the constant angular momentum vector, which is in the blue, and the y-axis completes the right-handed system. Now this is a non-inertial frame since it is rotating as the spacecraft goes around the Earth. And the red spacecraft has a body frame that is aligned with the inertial frame. So for the geostationary satellites in the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame, both their position and their attitude is stationary with respect to the surface of the Earth, which can be seen in the animation on the left here. Meanwhile, for the red spacecraft, in the inertial frame, its body frame is stationary, as is seen here, but from the perspective of the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame, it is rotating with the angular velocity of the Earth, as can be seen in the animation on the left. Here's a plot of some examples of what ground tracks can look like for geosynchronous orbits. Notice that they take on a figure 8 or an hourglass shape with respect to the surface of the Earth. This is a property that is useful about them since they are repeating ground tracks, meaning that they go over the same spots on the Earth every single day. So say that you wanted a satellite that was always over Southeast Asia, you could pick the inclination, eccentricity, and argument of periaps to do so, as is the case for these orbits here. And as usual, if you'd like to add your city to the ground track plots in the future videos, go ahead and leave a comment from where you're watching from. So the 35th video in this series, and this one I'm going to be going over geosynchronous orbits and going over some details of geostationary orbits. So let's go over the formal definition of a geosynchronous orbit, which is actually really simple. So a geosynchronous orbit is any orbit that has an orbital period equal to one Earth sidereal day which is about 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. Notice that it's not 24 hours, which is one of the reasons that we have leap years every 4 years. So I will talk about in more detail what a sidereal day is and why it's different than a solar day in the next slide. So since we know the necessary period for a geosynchronous orbit, we can calculate the semi-major axis from this equation. So we have the equation that the period of an orbit, usually noted as either capital T or capital P, is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the semi-major axis cubed over mu, where mu is the gravitational parameter of the body. From this, we can solve for semi-major axis to get it as a function of period and gravitational parameter mu. And note that for each body in the solar system, they have a different angular velocity and gravitational parameter, but this equation applies to all of them, such as a Mars synchronous orbit or a Moon synchronous orbit. So the semi-major axis is equal to mu, times the period squared over 4 pi squared to the power of 1 third, which is the cube root. So plugging in the period of the orbit and the Earth's gravitational parameter, we get that the semi-major axis for a geosynchronous orbit is equal to 42,163.74 kilometers. And it's useful to note that this is actually very far away from the Earth. So say the orbit of the International Space Station is anywhere between 6,000 and 7,000 kilometers, which is roughly the radius of the Earth, plus anywhere between 300 and 500 kilometers. So going out to 42,000 kilometers is actually extremely far from the surface of the Earth. So now let's take a look at the difference between a sidereal day and a solar day. So in this diagram, we have the sun at the center, and we have Earth's orbit around the sun, represented as that circle. We have some inertial frame where the x, y axis align with the horizontal and vertical of this screen. We have the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame in blue, which at the two instances of Earth are also pointed in that same direction. And then we have these two sun-to-Earth vectors, which point from the center of the sun to the Earth at any given time. So we start with Earth at time equals zero, some arbitrary time, where if 
earth centered earth fixed frame is aligned with the inertial frame as can be seen in the diagram so after one sidereal day at earth equals or earth at time equals one sidereal day the earth has done one rotation 360 degrees with respect to the inertial frame so the earth has moved this far in its orbit and it's done 360 degrees of rotation so its body fixed frame is once again aligned with the inertial frame now notice that initially the y-axis was pointing directly at the sun at time equals zero but now since the earth has moved the y-axis is no longer pointing at the sun and there's some sort of angle here theta that represents the angle between that y-axis and the sun to earth vector and this is why the sidereal day is different than a solar day because the sidereal day is one rotation with respect to the inertial frame but a solar day is one rotation with respect to the sun so because the earth has moved here the earth has to rotate a little bit farther in order to again align its y-axis with the sun and now in reality this is roughly about one degree i just wanted to make it bigger to be able to show it in the diagram but this rotation represents roughly four minutes longer so a solar day is roughly four minutes longer than a sidereal day because it has to make up this extra little rotation so to go over some advantages of geosynchronous orbits and why you'd want to use them, one of the main reasons is that they have repeating ground tracks. So you can o go over the same spots over the Earth every single day. So as I said earlier, so say you wanted some satellite that you want to observe Southeast Asia all the time, you can do that. And also, there's a, the special case of geostationary orbits where actually the ground track of that just looks as a single point along the equator. So you, uh, you can think of this cursor right here if you want it to be in a geostationary orbit would just look like that. Where it's just stationary over one point of the Earth. And obviously that is very useful because you can always look constantly at one place in the Earth. And this is very heavily used in communication satellites. And another advantage is because they're so far away from the Earth, their semi-major axis is so large, the perturbations are very small to their orbital trajectories. So you only have to worry about n-body perturbations, where the biggest perturbation would be, say, the pole of the Moon, the Sun, and Jupiter, and then solar radiation pressure. However, these are actually very small. The, the Moon one can get a little bit larger, but in general, they're very small, and they're a lot smaller than, say, the J2 perturbation when you're in low Earth orbit. So that's also another advantage that you can use less fuel to remain in this orbit and where you have the constant repeating ground tracks. So that's pretty much it for this video. Be sure to hit like and subscribe if you liked the video and to give me a comment to let me know what you thought to help me out with the YouTube algorithm. And for a follow on video of this is to get into the specific case of geostationary orbits where I can go over the geostationary area reservation so you have a certain amount of angle, argument of periaps that you can be so you don't try to, you don't get too close to any other satellites in geostationary orbits. I'll also go over the orbit station keeping, so keeping track of that lunar gravity and solar radiation pressure, how that is making you deviate from where you want to be, and also graveyard orbits because these satellites eventually go to the end of their life and they have to be disposed of, where disposed of just means they get put in a stable orbit that will never hit another satellite, which is another very interesting thing about how these satellites are handled. And in the next video, so let me know how much interest there is for this geostationary orbits video. And the next video I plan on doing is going over interplanetary home and transfers.